Luke chapter number 2, just going to read one verse, verse number 7. The Bible says, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now this isn't part of the message, we're going to pray in a second, but the Bible said she brought forth her firstborn son. Now, there are some that teach that Mary was a perpetual virgin. Well, you'd have a real problem with the Bible, because if Jesus was her only child, it said she brought forth her son. It said her firstborn son. Now, biblically, if you was the firstborn child, you was the child of significance. That means all the inheritance went to the firstborn. And he was responsible for taking care of any of the siblings. But if we had time, we'd look at Mark chapter 9, you find she had other children. Jesus had stepbrothers and stepsisters. Hmm? She wasn't a perpetual virgin. And let me just say this while we're on Mary here. Mary was just a vessel. She was favored among women. And all of mankind, God looked down and said, that little maid right there is the one I'm going to choose for my son to step into her womb and bring salvation's plan. Mary had no special anything about her. She was just a vessel. She was a virgin. She gave birth to the darling son of God. But Mary had to get saved by the grace of God just like us. Mary gives one commandment in the Scriptures. At the marriage at Cana, she tells all those around there, this is my son, whatsoever he says to you, do it. And can I say, the command of Mary is still in effect today. Whatever Jesus says, do, do it. Nowhere in the Scripture does it say that Mary can save us. Nowhere in the Scripture does it say to pray to Mary. The Scripture says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. He's our advocate. He's our intercessor. He's our hope. He's our Savior. Yes. Mary can't save you. She can't answer your prayers. Mary can't help you. The only help Mary could give you, she gave that night several thousand years ago when she, being used of God, delivered the Son of God into this world. I don't know why I said all that. But as I read that word firstborn, it stuck in my mind. Let's pray and ask God's blessing to the Word of God. Father, we love you. We are so grateful for the Word of God. It's the absolute and final authority for our lives. God, we don't base things on tradition. or We don't base things on philosophy. We don't base things on reasoning. Our life is based upon what thus saith the Lord. And Father, you are our hope. And God, we are thankful for the day you allowed your Son to be born into this world that we might have life. Now, Father, help us today. Lord, it's so good to see some who have been sick back amongst us. Lord, we know there are others right on the brink of being able to come back, and we're excited about that. We do pray, Father, for Miss Brandy in the hospital. We pray for uh, Miss Mary and Miss Cinda's mother who's in the hospital. We pray, Father, for my Aunt Bonnie who's in the hospital. We pray you'd touch them. We pray for others that are sick, you would touch them. We pray for our divided country right now, Lord. Now, Lord, we realize the Scripture said that nations that forget God, all nations that forget God shall be turned into hell. There's so much hell going on in the streets of America because our nation has forgotten God. I pray through this turmoil and through this crisis and through this pandemic, many would turn to God and we once again would be a godly nation. Now help us this day. You know each and every one of our hearts. Speak to us. Deal with us. Help us, Lord, to draw strength from the Word of God. Bless these in attendance today and get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to some things about the Christmas story we may not think about. Can I say most of what people think about the Christmas story is tradition. A lot of things that you'll do in the next couple of weeks, you do it because you've always done it that way. 
that's the way you do it. Uh, and there's a lot of things that cause people to believe what they believe based on what they've been exposed to. But I want to look at some things and look at the, some things a little different this morning. I want you to notice, first of all, the peril. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says this, And it came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that just Rome would be taxed. Is that what it says? It says all the world should be taxed. Rome was ruling the world or the known world at that time. And all the world that was known at that time that had an economy, that had people, they all were taxed. That brought peril upon the, uh, upon the world. Can I say there was a global problem? Hmm? And can I say as we stand here today, we face peril. Who would have ever thought something born in a laboratory in a mi through a microscope and a test tube would affect the world? One little virus has shut down the world. This world's in peril. Uh, things happen so much and so rapidly, they didn't know how to answer it. And so they did the best they could to tell you the symptoms and tell you what to do. And what, isn't it amazing? None of it works. But isn't it amazing this terrible thing that was so uh, bad that it shut down the whole world? Just makes you sick for a couple days. Less than five tenths of percent of people get it, die. But to listen to them talk, Lord have mercy, we're going to have gas masks for it's all over. Hmm? And by the way, I wouldn't be in line to get that vaccine next week when it comes out. I read last night that the vaccine they introduced to Australia, they've already stopped issuing it because the vast majority of the people that took it got AIDS. I think I'd rather have COVID. A report came out earlier this week, and here's the problem. It normally takes about four to five to six years to get a vaccine because they test it on a lot of things to see what kind of reactions folks have to it. Well, this one's been rushed together about eight or ten months. They haven't tested on a whole lot of people. What I heard the other day is a lot of people are getting Bell's palsy from what they're going to introduce here in America. My face isn't that good anyway, but I want half of it drooping. You know what I'm saying? But the world's in peril. They were in peril. Think about it. Now, here was the problem. If you were in Egypt, but you was born in Bethlehem, you had to travel from Egypt to Bethlehem to pay your taxes. Isn't it amazing whenever somebody wants to control you, it's never convenient for you? Just thought I'd help you with that. We see the peril. I want you to notice the plight. Look at verse 4. I'm going somewhere. Hang with me. I know some of you have been watching on the couch and you're not used to being back in church, but just, just hang with me. Uh, Miss Crystal on the couch eating bonbons watching Brother Doug preach. <laughs> Verse 4 said, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, which is the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. I brought out last week. She, she was espoused to him. He hadn't known her yet. She's a virgin. Being great with child. I remember those days. Uh, I remember when Jordan came along, August was really tough. Because Miss Annette was great with child, because he was born in September, and it was hot that year. Mm. Mm. I remember when uh, Christian came around. He was born in May. It wasn't as bad. Sydney came around. She was sick the whole time she had Sydney. The doctors thought she was trying to uh, make herself sick so she wouldn't gain weight. She only gained about 10, 11 pounds with Sydney. She didn't gain much weight. Uh, but I can tell you this about Sydney. She couldn't wait to get here. I mean, you know, they sent me out to give Miss Annette a epidural and paged me to come back in. Sydney was already here. She wasn't waiting for all that. Um, but here she's great with child. Any of you ladies had a, had a baby? 
You know, once you get about to that eight, eight and a half, ninth month, where you're just miserable and can't wait to have it. Now imagine coming from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Great with child. And think about it. Uh, there's a plight going on here. Think about the trip. Now I know all the Christmas shows show her riding on a donkey. She could have been on a camel. It don't matter. It don't matter if you're in an ambulance. You're miserable. And she might have had to ride a donkey. She might have had to ride a camel. But you know what most people had to do? Walk. Imagine the plight of the trip. No matter how she got there, those many miles, she was miserable. Not, not only the trip, notice the travail. She gets there and she delivers a child. She had no epidural. She had no medication. She had to deliver that child. Now, if you've had a baby, you ladies know what a blessing that is. The travail of giving birth. Hmm? You men that have been in a room with your wife giving a baby, you know what a blessing that is. I told y'all before, when we went in with Jordan, I told the doctor, either she gets an epidural or I get one. Something's going on here. Uh, it's, a, it's a hardship. It's part of the curse because Eve was deceived. God told her she would pay for that in childbearing. It's travail. And then there's the plight of the terms. She wasn't in a hospital. She wasn't even in a nice, comfortable hotel room. She's in a manger. She's in a stable. Hmm? Wasn't very sterile. Wasn't very comfortable. Wasn't very clean and, and, and encompassing. No. She's in a manger. Now think about this. She didn't have her mama there. Hmm? Now there's something about when a lady goes through that, her mama being there to comfort her because her mama's been through it. Now keep in mind, she's with Joseph. Joseph's never even seen her without any clothing on. Can you imagine the embarrassment of giving birth and going through all that with a man who really hasn't known you? You have no mother there, no sister there. Nobody there that you can have any kind of dignity with. See, we well, don't think about that. She's in a manger. She doesn't have her mother. She don't have a midwife. There's nobody there to deliver this baby. Joseph was a carpenter. He wasn't like David. He wasn't like a shepherd. He's not around animals seeing how the animals are born. He's, he's, he's probably freaking out too. Can you imagine... Not only the peril, the plight of all of this. See, when you read the Christmas story, all you think about is the baby Jesus all wonderful. I want to tell you, it wasn't all wonderful. Then I want you to notice, if you will, the principles that are there. Who's in the Christmas story? We see Mary's here. Joseph's here. Hallelujah, the baby Jesus shows up. He's here. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. But then notice, if you will, they're shepherds in verse number 8. And they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And then notice there's an angel in verse number 9. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. They were sore afraid. And then we find there's a heavenly host shows up, verse 13. The Bible says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And that's the Christmas story. This is what I want to preach on for a few minutes. I want to preach on what's missing from the Christmas story. What you hear sung about, what you hear talked about, what you see on TV, and a lot of things you, you've come to accept as part of the Christmas story, it's not there. Can I say, first of all, there's no wise men at the manger. 
They're not there. Do you see them there in Luke chapter 2? If you find them in Luke chapter 2, raise your hand. Anybody see the wise men there? But every manger scene, you see three wise men. Hmm? And I say you don't see a star there. Every nativity scene, you see a star. But nowhere in the Christmas story do you see the star. Can I say this? You see no gifts there. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We three kings of Orion. I love that song, by the way. But you don't see any gold, frankincense, and myrrh there, do you? Flip with me over to Matthew chapter 2. Go back a couple books to Matthew chapter number 2. So why it's important to study your Bible. Because history and tradition will lead you astray. Look at Matthew chapter number 2. Verse number 1 says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men, here they are, uh, from the east to Jerusalem. Now if you just stop at that verse, you would think the wise men were there when he was born. This is why you read the Bible. Verse number 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen, what? His star. Whoa! Now we got the star. We got the star. We got wise men. All right, let's throw them over to manger. Hmm? No? Let's read on. We've seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this it is written by the prophet, prophet Micah, by the way, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not thou the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately uh, called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when he had found him, uh, bring me, when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had departed the king, they, or when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, here it is again, the star. Uh, which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And uh, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. Here's verse 11, very important. And when they were come into the manger, stable, barn. Is that what it says? Now he's in a house. They saw the young child. Did it say Baby. Now, in Luke 2, he, they said the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Here it says, young child. you think the Lord knows the difference between a baby and a young child? Huh? And the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There they are. Hmm? Now, verse 12 is very important. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed in their own country another way. Well, first of all, anybody that ever comes to Jesus leaves a different way. Hmm? But by the time the wise men get there, they're in a house. And he's no longer a babe, he's a young child. Now, a couple things. We'll get back to our message, but number one, how come there's only three wise men in your manger scene? We don't know how many wise men there were. It just said wise men. Could have been a whole caravan. Now, they say three because they only gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They gave three gifts. But who knows? They could have all gave gold. They could have all gave frankincense. They all could have gave... We don't know. It's speculation. Again, it's tradition. When the wise men did not go back to Herod, Herod was so troubled there was a king in Israel that was going to rule that he sent out a decree and he slaughtered every male child under the age of two. Two and under got slaughtered. It's known as the uh, slaughter of the innocents. 
So Jesus was somewhere between a baby and two years old. Remember, they inquired of the wise men about the time they saw the star. So the wise men weren't at the manger. That's why they're missing. The star wasn't at the manger. That's why it's missing. The uh, gold and frankincense and myrrh was not at the, at the manger. That was why it's missing. What else was missing from the Christmas story? Can I say? Livestock's mentioned, missing from. Look in Luke chapter 2. Show me where there's an ox and a cow sitting next to Jesus. Listen, I don't know anything about Joseph, but if he it was any kind of a man at all, if there was any animals in that barn, he would have put them out in a corral and at least give her a little bit of dignity. No sheep in there. There's a lamb in there. The lamb of God. Hmm? I'm just talking about what's missing. I know this is upsetting all your Christmas carols. I'm not telling you to throw your way in manger scene. I saw one yesterday I about bought for the church, but I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking for a big one. You don't see them anymore. I want a big one. I either want a big porcelain one to put out there, or I want one of them huge old-timers with the, with they all light up and have Ray build a manger, or Josh, somebody built and put it out there. So everybody's, you know, I love Christmas. But I'm just telling you, the Christmas story, there's a lot of things that you've been taught and a lot of things you've heard that aren't true. Hmm? What else was missing? There's no drummer boy that shows up. You know, as a kid, I played drums, you know, and when I was a kid, I loved that song. Now that I'm old, I hate that song. Bum, bum. I tell you what version, it's good. If you haven't heard it, it came out this year. Carrie Underwood's version where her little boy sings it. It's cute. But, you know, pa pum pum out of town. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't there. No la I have the original Christmas album when that came out. That I had when I was a kid, when I was about four, it came out. I've still got it, the original Christmas of the little drummer boy. We do not play that at the foster household. Huh? He wasn't there. No little drummer boy where the oxen and you know lamb or donkey or whatever join in. They, they weren't there. Huh? Can I say this? Hallelujah for this. There's no partridges in any pear trees at the manger. I hate that song too. Huh? Why does it have to be 87 verses long? Huh? It wasn't there. You know what else was it there? There was no fanfare. There was no celebration. There was nobody that came out to see. Just the shepherds. There wasn't any lights. There wasn't anything out of the ordinary. Everybody that had been born in Bethlehem came to Bethlehem to pay taxes and nobody gave any, any care. That little maid gave birth that night to the Son of God. Can I say this? Kids, hope this don't upset you. But there wasn't no fat guy in a red suit there. He wasn't there. Hmm? I know you like Santa Claus is coming to town, but I got news for you. Jesus came to the world. Hmm? So we see some things that was missing, but let me tell you what you will find as a result of Jesus coming. Can I say, first of all, you'll find that in the midst of your darkness, there's light. Hmm? It don't matter if you got COVID. Don't matter if you've got cancer. Don't matter if you're facing opposition. Don't matter if you're losing your job. Uh, don't matter if you can't pay your bills. Uh, don't matter if you've got a spirit of oppression surrounding you. Uh, doesn't matter what you're facing. Uh, in the midst of your darkness, uh, the light of the world came, uh, and you can find Him, uh, and He'll step into your problems, uh, and He'll handle whatever you can't. Uh, you'll find in the midst of your darkness there's light. Hmm? You'll find that when Jesus shows up, darkness dispels. Darkness does not overcome light. Light dispels darkness. Hmm? And we've done that when we have candlelight services. You can light one candle in this room. This room can be totally dark. You can light one candle and the darkness starts to dispel. And the more candles that are lit, the darkness flees. And I've got news for you. When the light of the world steps in, your darkness will leave you. Hmm? 
Can I say what else you'll find in lieu of the Christmas story? Can I say you'll find in lieu of all of our deficiencies, you'll find that you're yet loved. Let me help you with something. There's nobody perfect. The only one that was perfect was the one born that night. Every one of us have deficiencies. Every one of us was conceived in iniquity. Every one of us were born sinners. Every one of us has faults, failures. Every one of us. Every one of us comes short of the glory of God. Every one of us, all of our righteousness is filthy rags. Every one of us has problems. You know why there's bullies in the world? They're trying to reflect their own deficiencies by picking on somebody else. Hmm? But we all have problems. We all have deficiencies. We all fall short. But I got good news. When he came to this world, he came with a word that he has loved us with an everlasting love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You are loved. It don't matter if you don't fit the mold. It don't matter what somebody else thinks of you. It don't matter what you think of you. You look in the mirror and you see all kinds of faults that m many people never see about you. Uh, but I've got good news. Uh, uh, regardless of how you see yourself or how anybody else sees you, uh, God looks at you through eyes of love and He loves you, friend. He loves you beyond your comprehension of what love is. He don't love you with a fleshly, selfish love. He loves you with a holy, inspiring love. He loves you in spite of your faults and your deficiencies. He loves you anyway. Brother Peter, he didn't have to love us, but he chose to love us. Hmm? He loves you. Regardless of what's going on, he loves you. Regardless of how dark it gets, you can find light. Because of that night. Can I say because of that night we learn that the devil cannot prevent the Lord. The first promise of Jesus coming into this world is Genesis 3.15. Right after the fall when God looked at the serpent, the devil, and he told him uh, 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 he's going to send uh, his seed through the woman. He said and he'll bruise your uh, head and you'll bruise his heel. And from that day, the devil has tried to discredit the coming of the Lord. And can I say, even after he's born in the slaughter of the innocents, he tried to destroy the Lord. Throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, he tried to do away with the Lord. And even when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying uh, uh, for you and I, uh, uh, he tried to kill him in the Garden because had he killed him in the Garden, my dear friends, there'd be no hope for you and I because he had to die the death of the cross uh, 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 to fulfill the Scriptures. Uh, but the devil couldn't prevent the Lord. The Lord has all power. God uh, proved it that night. How many times do you think she had contractions on the way to Bethlehem? How many times do you think the devil tried to get the, uh, whatever modes of transportation she took, whether it was a camel or a donkey, or she walked a step in a hole so maybe she'd give birth there on the side of the road? Because had she, then the word of God wouldn't be true because the prophets prophesied he'd be born in Bethlehem. Yep. We just find because of that night, the devil couldn't prevent the Lord. Now, i got good news for you. The devil can't prevent the Lord in your life. Hmm. You can you can crawl up in a, in, in a fetal position say, and complain about how what the devil's done to you all you want to, but all you got to do is look to the Lord. The Bible said, "Draw nigh to God; He'll draw nigh to you." Uh, the Lord can help you with that devil problem you got. Hmm. I thought about this in lieu of that night. And what you don't find, what you do find, is Jesus was born to die that you and I might live. He said, I am come to give you life and life more abundantly. What he's basically saying, he said, you can have a better life now, but then you get eternal life, the abundant life. Hallelujah. I have life forevermore. I did a funeral yesterday, an 87-year-old man that was a preacher. I told his family. I said, look, 
I said, everything he preached about all them years, he's now experienced it. Uh, what a blessing. And can I say, I've told you this, if one day you wake up and you get news and you look in the obituaries and you see that Doug Foster died, call him up, tell him to retract it. See, I died out to sin March 1974. And I received eternal life. And I'll live forevermore. The Bible said to be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. Uh, I tell you what, friend, when I check out and I change my wardrobe uh, and I lay this old flesh down, I'll just start living. You know what I'm saying? Uh, life will become more uh, than it's ever been on that day. Hmm. I praise the Lord. But you see, he had to die for you and I to have life. See, he was born that night for one reason, to go to a cross. Now see, if you don't understand it all, read John chapter number 1. This is when Jesus started. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and that's capitalized. And the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Jesus always has been. He's part of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, they've always been. They're Alpha and Omega. But he chose to leave glory chose to take off uh, his heavenly robes and wardrobe uh, and step into the womb of a little virgin made and be born in this world and put on flesh. He had to become like us so one day we can become like him. He became our kinsman redeemer. He had to be born so he could die that you and I could be born again. See, we were born in this life. But if you're going to heaven, you've got to be born again. You've got to be born of the Spirit of God. You've got to be forgiven of your sins. You've got to be adopted into the family of God. One of the most religious men in the Bible was Nicodemus. He came to the Lord by night. He's a Pharisee. He had the first five books of the Bible committed to memory. He had committed his life to servitude in the temple. And he came to the Lord by night. He said, we know you're of God. Nobody does the miracles that you do, except he be of God. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's a religious man. Had the first five books of the Bible come in. I don't know any Baptist that's ever done that. And he said, what is it going to take for me to get to heaven? And Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, ye must be born again. He said, how can I enter my mother's womb when I'm old? He said, you've got to be born of the water and of the Spirit. You must be born again. Your religion won't save you. Your good works won't save you. You've got to become a new creature. And the only way you can do that is through me. Jesus went on to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. He had to be born to die that you and I might live. And I thought about this lastly. What you do find in Lou the Christmas story is that we have to make a choice. See, when the shepherds heard of the good tidings of great joy, they had to choose whether or not they was going to go see it for themselves. And when they did, they left rejoicing, telling everybody what great things they saw. And they were left praising God and worshiping God because it changed their life. They chose to come to Jesus. See, we have a choice. We can choose eternal damnation by ignoring the way of salvation, or we can choose eternal life by accepting the Lord. You see, there's only two types of people in the world. Those that are lost in their sins, and those that have been saved by the good grace of God. Those that have been saved, hallelujah, heaven will be their home forevermore. Those that are lost that reject Christ, will die and spend eternity in a place that was created to inflict punishment on the devil and his angels. Amen. A place called the lake of fire. They'll spend all of eternity paying for their own sins because they refuse to let Jesus pay for them. No one will die and go to hell and blame God. They'll have to face God and God will show them every opportunity they had to be born again. God will remind them of every scriptural message they heard. 
God will remind them every time they heard the name of Jesus. There are people going to Walmart today that will hear the name of Jesus. God will remind them every time they saw a Bible. God will remind them every time they went by a Bible-believing church. God will remind them of every time somebody invited them to church. God will remind them of everything that he put in their way to get their attention. And they'll bow their heads and die and go to the lake of fire. And there they'll worship God forever because they know God is justified in letting them go there. Because they rejected him. See, we have a choice. We can choose to be born again, or we can choose to die and go to hell. Now, if I could get saved for everybody, I would. I told you all the other night, if I, if I had the power to heal, the hospitals would be empty. If I had the power to save folks, I'd save everybody. But you see, I had to make a choice for myself. And I did that in March of 1974. I chose to accept the Lord and receive Him as my personal Savior. See, a lot of focus this time of year on gifts. I like gifts. I like giving. And I'm not going to lie to you, I like receiving. I like giving and receiving so much I already bought myself some gifts. Because I get it all one shot. I got to give it and I got to receive it. Christian's so stinking mad at me. Everything I want to buy, you already buy yourself. Hey, you're too late. Snooze, you lose. He said, for years, you and my mom complained about not being able to buy mom and pa or anything because if they want it, they go get it. Now you're doing the same thing. Ba, 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 na, 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 boo, boo. Who cares? I like giving and receiving, so I just do it. Don't you like buying yourself stuff? I do. Huh? And I did get that gun safe you wanted. It looks good in my office. Hmm? Merry Christmas to me. Huh? I like gifts. Don't you, don't you like giving something to somebody? And oh, I forgot to pull it down. Miss Tay wrote a wonderful thank you letter. I'll bring I'll read it tonight. She got to take them gifts down to them foster kids yesterday. Didn't you feel good buying them gifts for those kids? Isn't that wonderful? Huh? She said a few of them got to open one yesterday. Huh? You know, it's kind of like when you get saved. You just get a little bit. The best is yet to come. Huh? <laughs> we just got the earnest of the Spirit. The rest of it's coming. Hmm? Hallelujah for that. But you see, the greatest gift happened that night when God gave His Son. Then He went to Calvary and paid your sin debt. And all you have to do to go to heaven is receive the gift that God gave. Say, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want to be born again. I want to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And friend, all that is available as Jesus came that night. So in all of our celebrating, it all should reflect Him. You put lights on your house, we got lights on our house. It's all about the light that came into this world. You buy gifts, it's because of God's greatest gift. You give gifts because God gave. You receive gifts because you received eternal life. It's all about Him. Hmm? Say, what about the fat guy in the red suit? Hey, he can get in on Christmas too. I don't care. Hallelujah. But it's all about Jesus Christ. No Jesus, no Christmas. Just a life of misery and woe. Oh, a few good days here and there, but the end result is hell. But because of Jesus Christ, it don't have to be. You can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. You know, even on my bad days, I still have joy in my heart because of the goodness of God. So I wonder tonight, or this morning, have you received Jesus? Do you know Him? Have you been born again? So, preacher, I've been baptized. Wonderful. Have you been born again? Preacher, I'm a member of the church. Wonderful. Have you been born again? 
Have you really received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Say, preacher, I don't know. Then you haven't. Because if you ever did, he changes you from the inside. You'll know. Hmm? I'll never forget that third Saturday night of March of 1974. He changed my life. That's amazing because I don't even remember yesterday half the time, but I remember that night. I've told this story. I'm trying to close, but I've told this story. It's a true story. <clears throat> my grandfather, most of you know, was a pastor. Pastor at the same church for 34 years. And my granddaddy, when I was little, when I was some of these boys' age, had a deacon, Brother Cheryl, Brother Cordell Cheryl. I'll never forget, Brother Cordell Cheryl was the first man I ever heard teach the book of Revelation. And he did a wonderful job. Now, he wasn't a, uh, a teacher or he wasn't a, uh, somebody that wore a shirt and tie and went to work. I mean, he taught the Bible, but he was an iron worker. Uh, he, he was a man that worked hard, worked with his hands, but he studied the Bible and he taught Revelation. And Brother Cheryl, he was, a, he was always, in my mind, a giant of a man. He was a big man and, and you know, just a good man, a godly man. Brother Cheryl got that dreaded disease called Alzheimer's. Now, it's still a dreaded disease, but they've come a long way than what they knew in the 70s. And he got so bad he didn't recognize any of his children, didn't recognize his wife. And he ended up having to put him in an Alzheimer's home up in Dayton, Ohio. Because of being an iron worker, he was so strong... He would hurt people. He, he thought he was a teenager, and they have to restrain him at times. And, and it's just a, a tragic thing. But I'll never forget, last time I ever seen Brother Cheryl, he'd gotten older and gotten feeble. And one of his sons brought him to church. Again, he didn't know who his son was, didn't know who his wife was, didn't know anybody there, but he knew the preacher. He never forgot one that introduced him to Jesus. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is, if you don't know, it's because you've never been there. But if you've received him, you'll know. Because he changes your life for our now and all eternity. And if you don't know him, I highly recommend him greatest gift I ever received you'd be the greatest gift you ever received oh you'll like the packaging <laughs> you'll like the contents you won't want to take it back or exchange it you'll be thrilled for all of eternity do you know him have you been born again if not, we're going to give you that opportunity today. Say, preacher, I don't know how to get born again. You come. We'll take a Bible. We'll get somebody to take a Bible. We'll show you how to be saved. You can be saved tonight or this morning. All you have to do is come to Jesus. Ask him to save you. And he will. Let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. While they're picking out a song. Let's pray. Maybe you want to come and thank God you received him as your Savior. Maybe you want to come and thank him that in the midst of your darkness you found some light. Maybe you need to come and be saved. We're going to pray the Lord's will in this invitation. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for what you did on that night. Thank you for what you've done on the day you went to Calvary. Thank you for what you've done that early morning when you resurrected. Thank you for what you've done in my life the night you saved me and what you've done in my life every day since. Lord, you are a great God. Thank you for loving us sinners. Thank you for caring about those that some don't care about. Thank you for being a great God. Now, Father, we pray your will be done this invitation. There's folks praying all over the altar. I, I don't know what they're praying about, but you do. Father, help them. Lord, there may be some need to come. Just thank you for being a good God. Maybe somebody needs to come and just tell you they love you. Maybe somebody tonight or this morning, God, needs to come and trust Jesus as Savior and be born again. Lord, bless this invitation now. Speak to hearts. 
and help us, Lord, to spread the glorious good news of the gospel and help us to shine as lights because you shined on our hearts. Have your will and way now in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.